begin this theological hour. So as we begin this theological hour, may I ask everybody to please settle in, those who are finished with the registration. And to begin with, let us ask Brother Mark Louis Casipong, Apache missionary, to lead us into prayer. Kindly all stand. Let us pray in the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Christus and loving Creator, we welcome your heavenly direction into our hearts as we come together in the spirit of synodality today. We acknowledge that despite of our differences, our common religious journey unites us. As we begin this endeavor, bestow upon us your wisdom. We hope that our conversations are characterized by mutual respect openness, and a sincere willingness to hear each other's out. Bless us with the bravery to welcome the diversity of viewpoints, realizing that it is only by discussion and cooperation we can comprehend well and you more fully. May your spirit be among us, leading our thoughts and deeds, enabling us to recognize the way you have planned for us. Please give us the ability to hear the voices of the marginalized, to speak up for those who are not heard, and to cooperate on building a community that embodies the diversity of your kingdom. We entrust everything to your loving care, confident that with you as our guide, our journey in synodality will be fruitful and transformative. This we pray in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Brother Louis. Uh, and may I ask again to please settle down. We have available seats in front. Those who are yet at the back, you may sit here in front so that you may hear the, pers the, the sweetness of the words of our speaker today. So... Again, I would like to introduce myself. I am Brother Jasril from the Piarist Fathers, and you have no choice. I'm your master of ceremony today. <laughs> so, Synod and Synodality is preskong chismi sa simbahan ngayon, no? It is considered to be one of the most talked event in the life of the church today. Some of us may know about it. Some of us may know little about it. Maybe it's me. Some, no one knows about it. October of the year 2023, the synodality begins. No? Attended not by only episcopical, episcopical authorities, but all walks of life, the opening to a broader horizon. And we are blessed. Actually, I want to say, she is blessed and she's worthy of all. Sana all pinagpala. Our speaker, not only there, but facilitated in the said event. So, without any delay, I know you're excited as I am, as enthusiastic as I am as today. I would like to introduce, uh, I would like to call Brother Ruel to introduce to us our guest speaker. A hand, please. Brothers and sisters, it is my honor to introduce our guest speakers for today's Theological Hour. She is a leading figure in theology and pastoral leadership and has significantly contributed to the global discourse of synodality. Currently serving as a non-voting expert at Synodal Synod Assembly in Rome, her insights have been instrumental in guiding the deliberations. Her influence extends globally, evident in her active participation in the Asian Continental Assembly and her role in synthesizing Synod. Synod Consultation's report on global scale as a faculty member of, e of the East Asian Pastoral Institute, she imparts her knowledge and passion for synodality, providing invaluable leadership 
and theology in pastoral matters. Her commitment to fostering the next generation of synodal leaders is evident through her engagement and formation programs. And now, without further ado, let us warmly welcome Dr. Christina Kang. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here with you. In the spirit of synodality, let's get to know each other. How many of you here are lay people, including professors? Lay people, okay. How many are religious uh, fathers or brothers? Not from the diocese. Okay, quite a number of you. Uh, how many sisters? Sisters. Oh, we need more sisters. Those of you who are watching online, sisters, come on, come to LST. And uh, how many of you are not from the Philippines? Okay, all right, quite a good number. You are not from the Philippines, okay? Yeah. You are, right? I... <laughs> and uh, lastly, how many of you are non-Catholics? Or... Oh, welcome! Jojo Fong, <laughs> yes, I understand, yes, I understand. Okay. <laughs> So, it's very, really, yeah, you will see later why uh, I open with this question because it's really important uh, to be together as an ecclesia, an assembly of diverse people, to journey together, uh, to know that we are not isolated in our own church, in our own context, in our own little box. And later I will share a bit more. While you are in this school, this is a very precious time uh, for you to, to um, experience this diversity in the church. And you have to make the best use of your formation years here at LST. Um, as uh, you rightly said, uh, this synod has got a lot of attention since it was announced. In 2020, uh, the theme of synodality was uh, officiated. Uh, that created a lot of buzz. Uh, but further and further along, you know, there were even more expectations you know, that you know, this could be a synod that will change the church, that will uh, transform the church. And even uh, theologians, you know, they were saying that uh, this synod... Um, it could even be seen as the most important ecclesial event after the Second Vatican Council. Okay, imagine that. So next time, uh, now, now we study Vatican II, right? And we read about people who, who, uh, who lived during that time of Vatican II. So next time, uh, you know, the newer generation, they will study this synod and they will talk about you because you, you lived and you did your formation during the time of the synod. And perhaps when you're old, you're giving a lecture in your 70s or 80s, you can say, oh, you know, I was in LST during the time of the synod and, and there were so many uh, things going on okay yeah maybe we'll see okay uh, now synods are not new um, the synod in recent years has gotten a lot of attention right you're familiar with the synod on the family first and then we had a synod on youth and then an extraordinary synod on the Amazon uh, but um, all these are different areas of mission, different topics for the synod. So synods are not new. But what is so uh, special about this particular uh, synod? Can anyone tell me? What, what's so special about, about this synod? We, we've had synods before. So what's so special about this one? Yes? Okay, if you, if, you, if you look at the logo, what's so special about the logo? Do you notice something? A synod of the church and not a synod of bishops. Uh, yeah, okay, you can, you, in a way you can say that I shan't uh, uh, correct your professor in front of you. But anyway, he's my good friend. <laughs> he's my good friend. We go, back, we go back decades and decades and decades before Vatican II. Okay. <laughs> well, I, let, I, will, I, will, I will tell you why, what, what, you, what, what special features about this synod you can tell from this logo. But first of all, the very um, novel and new thing about uh, this uh, synod is the topic itself. You know? The topic is about us as a church. Uh, the main question is, you know, a synodal church in announcing the gospel journeys together. How is this journey together happening today in your local church? 
Number two, what steps does the Spirit invite us to take in order to grow in our journeying together? And if you look at the first question, right, that is so unique because it's an ecclesiological self-evaluation. For the first time in the church's 2,000-year history, we are um, embarking on a self-reflection, uh, um, a self-examination. It's like we, we go with the whole church go on a retreat together to uh, take a good look at ourselves, a good honest look and, and to say, you know, to, to see how, how, how is our quality of relationships, our communion, participation and mission, what are the lights and shadows of journeying together. And so that, that self-evaluation is already a very, very important first step in discernment. Then the second thing that's very special, as uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Jojo Fong said, the, the whole community, you know, the synod uh, of the people, uh, the whole community undertaking uh, and involving the whole uh, people of God, it's a, it's a communal affair. It's not just something uh, for the bishops. Uh, it's a whole uh, process. So you can see from this logo, it's the whole church walking together. Who do you see is the first person? Who's the first person in this logo? The little child, yeah, little child. And then where is the bishop? At the back, not really in the back, at the, in the middle, right? In must uh, among the people. <laughs> then what's the big, the big orange one? Holy Spirit, okay. Yeah, that's up to interpretation, but, but uh, yeah, it's, it's meant to be uh, the Holy Spirit uh, leading and guiding, walking together with us. What else very unique do you notice about this logo? The most important part about this logo is actually the date. The date. If you see the date, it's, it's not one year, but it's originally it's three years and now it's changed to four years. Right? And it, it sends a clear signal that the Synod was not last month in October. The Synod began in 2021, right? When some of you with your local parish communities at the grassroots started this ecclesiological self-evaluation. And that's that is the Synod. That's not just the gathering feedback. Like that itself is the synod. So the synod is a, is a whole engagement uh, of the whole people of God, making this communal discernment together. Uh, and the third thing that's very unique about this synod is that it's a very open-ended search. If you look at the second question, it is phrased very open, in a very open-ended way. What steps uh, does the Spirit invite us to take in order to grow in our journey together? In other words, how can we do better as a church? You know, how can we, how can we improve things? You know, what, what, uh, what uh, do we need to do in order to grow better as a church? Uh, and the focus is very much on the Holy Spirit, okay? And you know that when, when you really hand over uh, control to the Holy Spirit, what can you expect? What can you expect? When you really, really give everything over to the Holy Spirit, what can you expect? Surprises. So, <laughs> you can expect the unexpected. So it's really been a synod of uh, surprises. The very first surprise and the sign that this is going to be a different synod was when one year after it was announced, uh, the, it was decided that the synod would be postponed to 2023 rather than 2022 uh, so that we can uh, explore a new process and make sure every voice is heard. In other words, this is not going to to be just a, a good intention to gather voices. In this way, the Vatican is showing that it's really serious in wanting to garner the voices from the ground. And so, you know, we, we give it another 12 months so that we can prepare well and we, we can really get more and more uh, people to participate. And that's already a concrete sign that they are trying to walk the talk, you know, to really uh, make it a good um, experience. 
So some key um, principles, some key uh, desires for this synod that were announced in this uh, news to postpone for one year, to prolong, to, I shouldn't say postpone, but to prolong for one year. Uh, first, in the Cardinal uh, Mario Gregg's speech, the Secretary of the, the, the Secretary General of the Synod Office, he says, you know, it's because we want to explore a new process, a new uh, synodal process, okay, even, you know, for our Catholic Church to explore new process is already a big thing, you know, okay, try, try exploring new processes in this school, I, I hope you will succeed, I'm sure you will. And then also involving all uh, the people of God, you know, so that every voice uh, might be heard. And, and this is a very, very strong emphasis. Uh, it really goes back to the theology of the church, the mission of all the baptized, and also the census fidei, uh, the Holy Spirit's presence speaking through everyone. Uh, and the thing is that it's not just baptized Catholics, uh, but the desire is also to, to involve um, ecumenical companions, okay, because the census fidei involves all the baptized, whichever uh, tradition you belong to, but also people of other faiths, even uh, people in secular society, especially the most marginalized, right? Um, and uh, it's a synod that's really focused on listening rather than telling. And, and the word listening is probably the word that has been most associated with this synod. And also to discern, uh, so as to understand how and where the Holy Spirit wants to lead the church. So all that was in the, the speech. Uh, this banner here of the Pope listening is probably one of the most common uh, visuals, right, that, you, you, uh, that has been associated. Associated uh, with this uh, synod. Already um, in this picture, the young people especially, are, they are getting a different impression of the church. You compare this with all the, the rigid photos of the clergy, you know, standing in a very serious way. Uh, this really changes uh, the, 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 the image of the church, so to speak. You know, there's this real desire uh, to be a listening church. And then uh, Pope Francis uh, uh, um, um, uh, clarifies uh, very often in the beginning, right, uh, what the census today is all about. Every time uh, uh, we want to tap on it, it's not a matter of just saying uh, what we think or comparing opinions in a very scientific way, talk, uh, sharing, uh, advocating about uh, what, what we want in a certain issue, not about uh, doing a survey. Uh, but really, it's a matter of coming together uh, like this group here, um, uh, listening to uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, so all these were the parameters that were set out in the beginning. So early 2021, uh, um, we started uh, getting, uh, uh, getting things in place and a commission called the Methodology Commission was set up. Uh, that's when I was uh, roped in to be part of this commission. And so the first challenge was, what kind of new process can we come up with that would meet you know, all these uh, requirements that we want uh, for this synod? You know, how, how do we do synodality? We, we've not really experienced it before. So as a, a commission for methodology, uh, we were people uh, from all, um, all over the world uh, with uh, some experience in methodology. But first, we have to start by um, listening, listening to and learning from uh, various experiences of synodal processes around the world. Uh, thankfully, at that time, Selam in Latin America, they were going through a very big ecclesial assembly. Uh, so they had some experiences of good methods that work. Also, Australia was going through their plenary council, and there were some other uh, countries. Uh, we could learn the strengths and the weaknesses of those processes. Uh, but not just experience, but we also have to identify from, from a good uh, ecclesiology of synodality what would be the key principles for this process that, that are non-negotiable. 
Okay, and then after um, uh, doing uh, our, our uh, discussion and meetings, uh, we decided that these are, are some of the key areas, you know, it has to involve mutual encounter, it has to involve dialogue, uh, reflection, uh, and uh, discernment, right? Okay, and also we had to adapt uh, suitable tools for this process, uh, tools that enable dialogue and encounter and discernment, uh, such as the spiritual conversation. At that time, you know, it was already current, it was already being practiced in some parts of the church. And most importantly, because it's a synod of the people, it involves all the people of God, we have to make it clear and doable, easy to follow, uh, interesting you know, and relevant uh, for people at the grassroots. So as we, we brainstorm, we plan and discuss uh, in preparing for this synod, it became very clear to us as we wrote in, in our guidebook, right, for all the dioceses to do that process, it became clear to us that uh, the purpose of this synod is, is not to produce more documents, but it's, it's, it's to inspire people to dream about the church we are called to be. To not lose hope amidst the, the scandals or people leaving the church or other um, um, uh, difficulties, the hierarchicalism that we have and all that. Uh, but really, you know, to, to have hope in the church again, to believe uh, in the church of Christ, to weave new and deeper relationships really to make our dream uh, and our mission alive again. And more importantly, the process itself, this three-year process, it aims at fostering a lived uh, experience uh, of uh, discernment, participation and co-responsibility. In other words, the method is the message. Okay, the method is the message. The method is not just a means to an end, to collect more info, to, to get more, more data. No, it's not that. The, the, the method that we are going to recommend in this uh, book, the Vademikum, uh, is itself the experience of synodality. So we really had to come up with a very good method. Uh, and in the end, we, uh, we, we came up with something that incorporated these elements. And, and these, is, these are things that you can apply if you are going to organize a consultation and dialogue session in your own congregation or your own uh, diocese or parish next time. First, you know, uh, uh, it has to favour group dialogue instead of individual surveys so that people come and, and listen uh, to each other, uh, uh, to, to really listen to the Holy Spirit together. Uh, it's good to ensure a diversity of group members, uh, a process that ensures equal voice for everyone and no one is uh, excluded. Okay, just because you have certain characteristics, you know, it doesn't mean that you are excluded, right? Everyone is included. God's love embraces everyone. You have to provide the basic church teachings. You can't just organize a session and ask your parishioners to come and give your point of view. Okay? <laughs> They'll be coming from all over the place. Uh, you, uh, you, you have to uh, form, form the participants, and that's very important. Traditionally, we call this theology from above, right? The, uh, making inferences from doctrine uh, for the present situation. So that, that theology from above is, is still important. You still have to incorporate that. Uh, but at the same time, you need the theology from below. The, the personal stories, the, the real life experiences of the people, that's where the spirit is moving as well. Uh, and, and, and you have to make room for that. Uh, we recognize that we need to have simple, relevant questions about synodality. The main question that I showed just now was broken down into 10 sub-questions. And it's actually through those 10 questions that people learn about synodality. If you don't know anything about synodality, you just look at the 10 sub-questions, you will know what synodality is all about. And so that's why, you know, Questions teach better than answers. That's good to know. Uh, it has to involve preparation with prayer and reflection. Uh, and we can always tell when the participant did not pray or did not prepare because they just come and talk 
from, from their own opinion, you know, and they fight from, from their own position, we can tell. And it has to involve um, attentive listening. In the Senate Assembly last October, one group had about 11, uh, 11 uh, to 12 people, let's say 11 people. So when I briefed my group, I told them that uh, there are 11 people at this table, so all of you are going to listen to 10 people and you will be only speaking once. That means 90% of your time, you will be listening. Right, so you, you have to treat this as a listening session, not as a talking session, right? Because you are, you are only speaking once, but you are, listening to, you, are, you are listening 10 times and you are speaking only once because there are 11 people. So, so people have to get used to, to listening, uh, to speak in a reflective way, not, not in an um, uh, impulsive way, but to speak from the heart after, after reflection, to say what you really truly mean. Uh, and that takes cultivation as well, and to be receptive to learning from somebody else. Right? Um, the method has to include time for silence, for, for inner awareness, people to, to get in touch with how the spirit is stirring within them, how they are feeling, and, and for the insight to deepen so that if they want to argue back to another person, um, after hearing for a while, after the time of silence, maybe their own view might change. You, know, you, you have to, to give people that, that kind of space and time. And then in this way, we, we learn to discern together uh, instead of debating. And, and, and the aim is to hear um, what the Holy Spirit is communicating to us and not to, not to come to the meeting with the aim of wanting to win uh, from your point of view. You know, that, that's not a good starting point. So uh, um, I believe the, the PowerPoints or the video would be available. And if you are going to organize a listening and consultation session, you could kind of use this uh, uh, as a, as a, a, a checklist of, of sorts. Okay, so all of this was uh, put into the Vademekum, the uh, guidebook for the local uh, groups to do their process. And we tried to make it as user-friendly as possible. You see everything there, step-by-step, uh, step, what to do, uh, and also uh, very detailed suggested guides for how to organize uh, a meeting. Okay, so, that, that, so the first challenge was, was done, so we were quite relieved. Then the second challenge for us was, you know, uh, since this is new, how are we going to spread the message? How are we going to get uh, people to participate? How to um, uh, um, convince, you know, some bishops and priests to, to participate? How to, how to train everyone? You know? Very few people will know this kind of method. Um, so the miracle was that um, we, we put out websites and uh, materials and uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, guides in our website. But uh, wonderfully, you know, there's just a multiplication of the loaves, you know, just individuals, young people, old people, lay people, priests and religious from all over the world. They started producing their own videos, graphics, cartoons, songs and poems. To, to teach other people how to do this process. It was fantastic. Uh, we, we never asked anyone to do it, but spontaneously, after seeing that, um, that uh, uh, um, a basic framework that we put up, people spontaneously uh, uh, put up their own uh, formation materials so that we created a web platform that, that they can share. Um, and to me, this is the census of the day, you know. Somehow, people got a sense of their co-responsibility and they were creating their own materials to teach uh, other people uh, for this process. Uh, and, and it really shows that co-responsibility well, is there right from the start. It's, it's in people. You, you just have to create the right conditions to bring it out and, and, and the creativity will, will come out. So meanwhile, oh, while all these uh, things were going on the ground, uh, at the, the Synod um, 
office level, we were also discovering more synodal ways of working, uh, which has never been done before. For instance, uh, uh, the Secretariat did not work alone, but worked with us, uh, multiple teams of people from all over the world to, uh, that have various roles, uh, methodology, as I mentioned, theology, spirituality, communications, uh, people from different continents, men and women, uh, ages, a lot of lay people as well. Uh, and what was also very um, new in this synod was the mutual accompaniment. We had so many Zoom meetings and face-to-face -face meetings uh, between the Vatican and Episcopal conferences, uh, contin continental representatives. And within each Episcopal conference, uh, the synod team also met with their diocese teams many times. And so they were accompanying each other uh, and in other words, you know, the, the, there's this synodality that's happening already while we were doing this process. Uh, another very unique thing was that the mass media was very, very user-friendly, very strong. It had a very um, good uh, public uh, strategy. And we were also very transparent. For instance, uh, when we synthesized all the, the global uh, feedback, um, there was a live stream of what was happening day by day. I was in that global team in, that uh, synthesized, that collected all the global uh, consultation reports and we synthesized them. Uh, Dr. Teresa Choi from Korea was also in that team. Uh, she's here with us today. Uh, and the reason, yes, yeah, so we welcome her. Uh, so the reason for this transparency was that very often people think that feedback goes into a black box and then they, they become suspicious of what, what you do with my feedback. Who is the one uh, uh, collating the feedback? Why is my feedback left out or, or whatever? So we recognize that it's very important to be transparent about what we do with people's uh, feedback and who are the ones who are synthesizing this feedback. It's not just some officials in black uh, sitting in Rome, but really it's all of us ordinary people who have experience doing this, including some theologians. And we, we got together and we are the ones who, who synthesized it. So transparency is a very, another, uh, another, a very important way to model uh, synodality. And then also making changes in response to feedback to be flexible, such as extending the timeline. And for the first time, we had a, a digital synod uh, where uh, people could also engage online and form that community online. So all this effort resulted in what was termed as the largest consultation exercise in human history. If you look at uh, these uh, statistics, only one Episcopal conference did not submit a report, uh, and that was Ukraine, right, for, for understandable reasons. Uh, that means you know, all the Episcopal conferences uh, submitted, uh, did, they did something, right? Not everyone had very, had great participation, but everyone did something. Uh, the Oriental churches as well, the Icastries, the religious, uh, and actually for this um, uh, synod, I would really, really like to acknowledge the contributions of the religious because they are the ones who, who really already model synodality for us and they were also the ones who encourage uh, people to participate, to engage in this process. Uh, so that their, their um, uh, contribution is, is really, really important. And after this synod, I'm, I'm convinced more than ever that we really need to promote religious life. But diocese, yes, you are important also. So we need to promote you too. <laughs> and lay people, of course. So um, uh, if you look at the, the digital synod, we ended up with more than 1,000 influencers. And they say that most of the people who engaged in the digital synod were those who have left the church. You know, in other words, if you look at this statistic, that, that should ring an alarm bell. It's really a new frontier for mission. It's where we can find uh, the lost, the last, the least. Uh, people who, who don't feel, uh, who, who feel estranged from the church. It's, that's where they are comfortable to speak. And, and, and we do need digital missionaries to, to reach out to them. So that's another thing that the Synod has revealed. 
Uh, and to me, the real unsung heroes are the local uh, synod teams and the digital synod teams. Some local teams travel very far uh, to um, rural areas to involve the people and, and they got such good feedback because the people are really touched you know, that, that they were included in this way and it makes a difference. Um, so when, when that happens, you know, people learned synodality because they did synodality. And these are some direct voices from the reports. You know, you know the, 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 the people say that you know, the, the consultation itself was really synodal, just like we wanted. Many were consulted for the first time, and the church has made us feel that we matter. So people have to experience synodality. Then they will understand what it is. They will understand what it means uh, to be church. Uh, to be included, to participate, to be co-responsible for the future of the church and the mission. And the listening brought a lot of joy, experiencing the Holy Spirit in conversation. And people enjoyed it. They, they want to, to continue. You know, so in my parish, it's so hard to, it was so hard to get people to go for Mass, but for the, the synod conversation that we had, you know, they were asking, hey, when are we going to have another one again? You know, <laughs> when, when, well, uh, we, should, we should continue this, the, this uh, group, group meeting. And they found it meaningful. They, they liked it. So that, there's something there. There's, there's, there's a little seed of that census for day that we really need to examine and to look into. Okay, and one of the uh, uh, key uh, realizations uh, from the people was that the church has been too exclusive. And that's why in our discernment uh, for this uh, um, uh, synthesis document, we chose, the, the, our biblical scholars chose this uh, verse, you know, enlarge the space of your tent. Because people feel that the, the church has become an institution for the perfect to, and to judge, you know, judging everyone else, rather than to be like Jesus, you know, where everyone is included at, at the table. You know, never mind um, what background you come from, uh, what you have done, but, but for Jesus, you know, everyone is, is included in, at the table. You know, everyone can find a home in Christ. Okay, so with this document, uh, we went to another new thing in this synod process, which is the continental stage. Uh, and it's been termed, you know, the, the most innovative aspect of this synod. Because for the first time, uh, people get a chance to give feedback to a draft that came from Rome. You know, it's, it's not just top down, but, but it's what we call circularity. You know, you can, you can um, you produce a document, you give it back to the people so that they can validate it, they can give feedback from their own uh, cultural, contextual point of view, uh, and then you fine-tune uh, your, your um, findings. Okay, so this is really new for the first time, and because of the Continental Meeting, we got such a rich and diverse input uh, from this synod, uh, from each continent's uh, perspectives, uh, and we have uh, people from all, um, all, all over the church coming together, not just bishops. It's because of the Continental Meeting that uh, the Synod Office was very, very convinced that the October Assembly, it has to be like this. You know, it has to involve uh, not just bishops, but all the people of God uh, sitting, sitting together uh, around tables and having a spiritual conversation with each other, discerning together. It was really the Continental, the experience of the Continental Assembly uh, that uh, laid the ground for how we organized the October assembly and also the continental team uh, were uh, um, uh, formed for the first time and people were working together as, as a continent and for some of us it's really a new uh, relationship so in a way you know we could see that Christ was building a synodal church uh, even as we were going through the process and that um, led up to the Instrumentum Laboris. Uh, and if you look at the Instrumentum Laboris, there's another big surprise. The surprise was there's no, not much text in it, but it's a list of questions. 
right? And for the first time, we are finally going to an assembly with open-ended questions for discernment rather than the predetermined answers and the speeches, okay? So how many of you have studied Vatican II already? How many of you have done your Vatican II module? Yes, not many. Okay. Do you know Vatican II? Okay. <laughs> okay. I think you probably have done it. If, if you remember, Vatican II started with 72 texts, 72 documents that are already drafted. So there's nothing to discuss. So after 60 years, we have finally, you know, um, done it the right way, which is to start a meeting with the questions for discernment rather than with the answers, with speeches and, and with texts. And the main questions for the assembly were these three. And it's very important because these are the three questions uh, that really um, explain what synodality is all about. Uh, the media has been, very, um, has been quite deceptive in that sense because they tend to focus on all the side issues uh, that are more controversial so that they will get readership. Um, and, and it creates conflict. But those side issues are really not what this synod is all about. Synodality is about communion, participation, and mission. And so these were the three key areas that, that we focused on. Uh, the assembly last October uh, had uh, 300 over voting members. Uh, for the first time, many uh, non-bishops and also a whole uh, uh, team of uh, people such as myself who were uh, facilitators or theologians or people who helped uh, the meeting along. Uh, we produced uh, the report of the meeting. Okay, this is this is not a, a, a magisterial teaching document. So that's why when you study theology, you, you have to be clear about the genre of all the documents that are produced by the Vatican. They don't all have have the same uh, uh, nature. Uh, this uh, document that came from the, the October Assembly is it's not a piece of magisterial text. It's a minutes. You could call it call it minutes of meeting. It's a report of the October Assembly spelling out the areas that need to be further considered as we go uh, to the next assembly, as well as those areas where action can already be taken because it's, it's plain and simple, you know, to encourage participation, mission and all those things. Um, but what's important about the October Assembly is not the report itself. Remember, the, the objective of this synod is not to produce documents, but to have a lived experience of synodality. So what I want to share is that um, uh, the that, that whole month that we spent at the synod is really uh, experiencing a new way of being church. And many, many people said this, from cardinals to the bishops to the, the priests and the people, sisters and the lay people who were there, uh, they really said that they, they, they really um, had a very rare and unique experience of the new way of being church. And what was this new way? First of all, it was a genuine ecclesia of, of people from diverse uh, places, uh, diverse parts of the church, like you see in this picture here. You know, it's really the ecclesia. This is us, right? And also, um, the very first emphasis is on encounter, conversation, and a fellowship. Uh, for the first time, the bishops were saying, you know, this, this synod gave them a lot of chance to really encounter encounter uh, uh, other people, to encounter one another. Uh, as Timothy Radcliffe emphasized in our retreat, you know, to become friends first, to build relationships uh, across continents, genders, vocations, etc., and to see ourselves as walking together. Then we can discern and make decisions, not the other way around. Uh, so this is something that's very important to remember when you go back to your diocese or parish or your, your congregation, um, build that relationship first and, and, and see each other as human beings uh, walking together, you know, not just as a, a statistic or as someone who has an opinion that you have to fight, but see each other as, as human beings, as brothers and sisters uh, in the Lord. Um, whatever position you have, 
whether um, um, you know the whole spectrum of of, of uh, Catholic uh, points of view, um, we are all in the same boat. You know, we are all the community, the disciples of of Christ, and and we have to see that uh, first and foremost as our primary identity, and that's so important. So it's very nice to to get to know each other, and I could say, you know, I have friends now from from the Oriental churches, from the Oriental rites, friends who have very different different points of view about the Catholic faith uh, from me. And also, there was a very good experience of participation. Whatever age you are, you are given the same time to speak. Uh, you are given the same opportunity to express yourself, uh, to also respond to other people and to shape uh, the group proposals together, not just one person. So the participation uh, was very good. And in this way, we really got the richness uh, of uh, different people's perspective, not just the one who talked the loudest or the one who has the highest rank or the one who is most authoritative. Even you know, the young persons, we, we could get their, their point of view and that was so important. And then also as a facilitator, what touched me the most at the round tables was that no matter how tired people were or how um, emotionally agitated, um, they really made an earnest effort to, to listen, to share, uh, to try to understand the opposing point of view, to ask questions and to try to learn something new from others. And this is something I can really testify. I, I was really very touched by, by the effort made uh, by the members of all my groups, how they really, really try uh, to understand, to, to listen uh, to the other side. And, and everyone knows that they are here to, to try to forge uh, a, a consensus uh, together. We didn't always succeed, but I can see that, that people were, were trying. And this is really, you know, um, uh, uh, something that enabled everyone to learn something new about the church. Uh, people were saying, you know, oh, you know, I never knew that, that uh, Chris. Catholics from, the, from Asia were, were thinking about this. Someone said that um, for the first time he, he realized that the Catholics from uh, another part of the world you know, have this feeling about colonialism and all that. Uh, so we try to, we, we, we begin to understand uh, each other better. That was important. Uh, and then another key thing was that the method enabled people to dialogue and make decisions in a group. And you need a very good structured process for this, you know, that enables people to exchange uh, points of view, to interact with each other. Uh, you look at the previous uh, synods, all the synods were like this. <laughs> okay, where, where is the dialogue? Where is the discussion? Where is the interaction and engagement? Right? Um, um, uh, the structure was that you, you, um, you indicate your intention to speak, you're given a time to speak, uh, you have a prepared speech, when it's your turn, you go up to the microphone, you speak, and then the next person will speak. So the, the person who speaks before you may have nothing to do with what you are going to say, and the person who is speaking after you will have nothing to do. So you might as well just email everybody your speech, right? No need to come to Rome. <laughs> The AI, the AI can synthesize your, your speech better. <laughs> and then so, so um, my, my colleague who attended the synod uh, on the Amazon, which was still like this, he told himself, oh gosh, you know, and he wished that the, 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 synod, uh, the synod, he knows, you know, the, this really can't be, it can't be the way to conduct a synod. There's, there's no interaction whatsoever. You're just going to Rome to make a speech and then you come home. We don't even know if they're listening to each other and there's no chance for, for interacting. So uh, uh, almost all the bishops I spoke to uh, at the assembly said that this, this, this particular synod was the first time that they really, really got to interact with other, even other fellow bishops who've been attending the synod with them. Okay, so dialoguing and making decisions in the group is very important. Uh, and um, uh, a lot of the, quite a number of the bishops told me that they were very convinced about the method that we use because um, what, the start, what they started off with in the first round, people's input, uh, 
evolved a lot such that by the time of the third round, the conclusion was very different from the, the first round uh, that they started off with. And somehow people's thinking evolved. There was, there was a development in, in the thinking, uh, in the synthesis, uh, and that's very good. Okay, and lastly, of course, uh, it was very uh, prayerful. We started with a, a retreat, uh, a lot of times of silence, and, and silence even during the meeting, uh, and uh, an integrated liturgy, and really, you know, uh, encouraging people to, to open themselves uh, to the Holy Spirit. Uh, a lot of uh, times of breaking up and slowing down as well. Okay. What could be improved, of course, quite a number of things. We, would, we still need greater openness in, in listening to some peripheral groups without the fear of compromising truth. So we have to be confident enough about our, our um, grounding in the truth and so that we, our ears are not closed from listening to someone who might be living a life that, that, that contradicts what we believe. We have, we, we have to be confident enough in our own beliefs to be able to, to listen to them and not to shut them up. Um, and then also there needs to be deeper dialogue between uh, opposing viewpoints because uh, at this particular assembly, this is just because it's just part one, we could get away with reporting about uh, what we agree to disagree on. So we didn't need to resolve those uh, disagreements, but, but uh, as we go towards the second assembly, we would, we would, we would need to make that, that, that the resolution. And so there's a need to be clear about what communal discernment and spiritual conversation is. A lot of people uh, criticize uh, spiritual conversation or communal discernment because they think that it's just about personal experience, personal uh, um, preferences. It's not. You know, you, you have to incorporate the theology from above, the, the church teachings from below and from above. Uh, left side, right side, sideways, you know, and other fields, uh, disciplines, the sciences, um, um, uh, psychology, social science, and the science of the times, right? But, but um, not, not just going to one side or the other, going back to the center, the, the core message of the gospel, and that is the criteria you use for evaluating and developing your conclusions. So not all personal experience is, is correctly to be incorporated fully into church teachings. Not all past tradition um, and teachings is to be fully and rightly incorporated into what, uh, uh, what we might believe today. It needs to be updated. Um, and so, like the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, you have to go back to the core message of Christ. You know, what, what, what would Christ do today? Um, what, 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 what is the message that call Christ would use to make a decision here? And so, as Pope uh, Francis says, we need to use a pilgrim a hermeneutic. He used this in his speech in the September 2021, where you know we 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 ha adopt this um, work in progress approach. We are always uh, pilgrims along the way. It's very progressive and it's very developmental. Okay. So what does it mean for you as people in formation? Let me share some thoughts. This is the most important part. The implications for all of you who are in formation or, or some of you are formators and what, what would it mean for the people that you are journeying with? Um, the first thing is I would encourage you to undergo this personal reflection this year as a way of participating in the synod process. First, what models of the church have I commented experience in my life growing up in my family, in my parish, in my local church? And what mental images uh, did you bring into your formation when you came to LST? What was the, your mental image of the church when you came, whether consciously or unconsciously? And during these years that you are in LST, what, what, how has your view of being church changed during this time of formation? And what new perspectives have you gained? Uh, maybe you, you learn from another part of the world. Maybe you learn from the lessons and your professors. And which aspects of synodality do I find most appealing and life-giving? 
And which aspects do I find most challenging? And to what extent is my leadership synodal? What might I need to pay more attention to? And what is the synodal conversion that I need? Okay. The second, um, don't worry, all this will be, will be given to you, I think, uh, the slides. Uh, the second reflection is on your local church. While you are here, it's the best time to reflect on your diocese back home. You know, what, what are some signs of synodality that's already present there? Uh, some are indigenous to the traditional culture, uh, but some are only emerging in present times, maybe because the younger generation, uh, they, they, are, they have ways to be more synodal than us. So sometimes they are the ones showing us how to be more synodal. Uh, and in what ways is there a lack of synodality? What are the, the underlying reasons? And how does that affect our mission? And, and what are the conversions we are called to take as a local church? And therefore, what, what would you want to be formed in before you leave the school? You know, what, what would you like to be formed in so that you can better serve uh, the church that you are, you are going to be sent to? So these are reflections you can do. And just a couple of slides on uh, how you can make the, the best, the, the most of your time during your formation. Right? First, uh, take responsibility for your own formation in synodality. Uh, welcome the opportunities to talk to people who are different. You may never get this chance again. You know, so make sure you, you speak and you get to know people from all the different countries. Uh, you work together in projects. You know, don't, don't just work alone all the time. Uh, reach out uh, to people who are on their peripheries, even beyond the school. Right? And very important, learn to appreciate your own voice and gifts. Uh, this, this one I, I have to keep emphasizing you know, to, to people who are coming from, from uh, Asian or African or other continents. You have, we, we, we tend not to value our own voice and we tend to play down our gifts. You know, we have to change that mindset. God, God gave us all very good gifts. and We have a voice. You know, the Holy Spirit speaks through our lives. So we have to value our own voice and gifts so that we participate, we don't just keep quiet. But at the same time, we listen to others, we recognize the, the gifts of others. Okay? And then also to approach the faith as, as a living tradition and not just uh, something that is frozen in the past, frozen in time, um, whether you choose uh, just uh, the, uh, the, the, the period before Vatican II or you choose the early church or, or the medieval times, uh, don't let that be frozen. You, know? you have to, 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 to learn to develop uh, in the faith tradition and move forward together by, by discerning, right? be, 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 be clear about what uh, our faith teaches, but also be alert to the signs of the times. And Pope Francis keeps emphasizing, you know, today uh, we, we need to grow in discernment. A lot of people who are formed as priests and religious, we, we show little ability to discern. We only know how to say can or cannot, you know, or yes or no. We, we always want this kind of direct answer because we, we don't want to discern and we don't know how to discern. So he really emphasizes uh, the need to discern. But to discern, you, you need to be, ongo be on ongoing learning. And that requires us to have the openness and the patience to, to stay in the tension of the questions, right? Not to rush to what we all, always know all the time, to, but to be able to stay with the questions, to not know so that we can search and discover. And he says, you know, we cannot do something good and evangelical if we are afraid of the squilibrium. Squilibrium means disequilibrium, like these people here. Right? If you want to discern, you have to get used to the, the, um, the, the, the journey of disequilibrium before you find the answers. And, and that requires uh, a bit of vulnerability. And we have to get used to that, not always to be, be certain all the time. 
and to seek a holistic growth uh, during your uh, formation years, not just intellectual, but also spiritual, human and pastoral, because these are the things that make you a more synodal leader. Um, very often when we talk about um, what is it we need to improve in seminary formation or, or religious formation to be more synodal, it always comes back to the human part, you know, the, um, uh, the human um, uh, 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 qualities, uh, the psychological, social, emotional development uh, to grow as a human person. Uh, and that, that has to be emphasized in, in the formation years, not just uh, up here. Okay, so I will, I will just leave these in the slides because this is about how theological institutions and pastoral institutions can contribute. It's about um, uh, developing our ecclesiology and the synodal methods of theologizing so that the, the whole curriculum and pedagogy can be updated and to build a, a synodal culture within this uh, institution as well. Okay, and I will leave you to this last paragraph from the synthesis report because you can take it as something that applies to you while you are studying here. Um, the, the paragraph says, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? And our Lord's question throws light on the work that now lies ahead of us. It's a matter of grasping what appears as a small seed, yet one that bears the future, and imagining how to bring it to the soil to grow for the benefit of many. Uh, so you are that small seed. Uh, whatever you, you gain here is that small seed so that when you go back, it can be planted in your home soil and it can grow uh, for the benefit of, of many people. And that, that's how uh, Christ grows and develops and cultivates uh, the people of God. Okay? All right. So thank you. Thank you, Doc, Doc Christina, for what an insightful and refreshing discussion no, about synodality. So I think, brothers and sisters, you and I can relate. When one is discerning for a vocational life, one is told to listen. The church wants to hear from where people are. I think that is the most important part of this uh, discussion. No, so without further ado, those uh, who are eager to ask the question, those who want to know more, may approach the microphones that we have here on the sides so that our guest speaker can answer your queries. So the microphones are open to those who has the question. So again, uh, those who want to ask the question may approach the microphone. Thank you very much, Dr. Kang, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I have um, some questions. Um, three questions, actually. Uh, first, like um, there are voting and non-voting members who are were not uh, bishops. And then, was what was the criteria for selecting uh, those members who who is going to be part of the synodal process? And was process and then criteria was transparent or? Is there any kind of representation of the whole people of God? That's my first one. The second one is a, this kind of um, open search kind of process, experiencing Holy Spirit. How does this a, a transformative experience for you particularly? And finally, how does the church uh, will not be just satisfied with this process, but does, it, does the church have any kind of milestone or kind of an action plan? To, to continue this wonderful, like, open-ended search and experiencing Holy Spirit to the, uh, toward the more inclusion, I mean, to the whole church. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, each continent had to submit 20 names. Um, and among those 20 names, there has to be diversity, uh, preference, you know, to include uh, women, youth, uh, pr uh, religious, uh, priests as well. Uh, so that, 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 that diversity was the criteria. They have to have been people who were closely involved in the synodal process, so that, especially in the continental meeting, so that they can bring 
the voices uh, from that continent and they have to be quite familiar uh, with uh, the mechanisms of that whole process so that we don't uh, start from scratch and that they have, they have already been um, cultivated you know, in this soil of the synod process. So each continent more or less knew who were the key uh, non-bishops who have been involved uh, in their continent. And, and we did more or less get, get uh, quite a good diversity uh, of, of people. I'm talking especially of the, the voting uh, members. Okay. Um, then um, the second, what does that? Un I, well, I hope that answers your question. Of course, no criteria is perfect, and it always can be can be improved upon. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, the bishops also had their um, their own uh, idea, or you know, of what what is the 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 the, the voice or the the um, the. Um, um, uh, the, the, the people, you know, that, that they would also want uh, to be included uh, in the assembly. But I would say even despite that, uh, there was a reasonable amount of, of diversity because if one, one um, continent um, includes, or if one country includes only people of a certain type, another country will bring people of the other type, you know, so there, there is still, the Holy Spirit has a way of assuring the diversity there. Uh, that goes to your second question. Uh, how, I, how it was transformative for me was, was to really know never to underestimate the Holy Spirit. Whatever you try to do to block it, it will find a way to come back. And so I had, I had really, really um, uh, an assurance, a very strong um, con, um, confidence, you know, that the Spirit was really working amongst us uh, with the grace to transform us. Uh, frankly, you know, uh, there were some harsh arguments at the table and as a facilitator, it was very, very uh, challenging to manage uh, some of these conversations. You could feel your own um, tension rising uh, as, as, as people from different points of view uh, started to get quite um, um, uh, um, um, uh, um, assertive with, with one another. You could feel the temperature rising. Uh, but, but, you know, um, the spirit is always working and somehow uh, we always manage to have a conversation uh, with the right level of tension and to be able to move forward. And that goes to your third question, which is about action planning. The, that's, that has two parts. The first part, which is very important to me, is that um, in, in the, the directions from uh, uh, this, this uh, Synod Assembly, local dioceses are already encouraged to start their own action plans because you have already, they have already gotten so much feedback from the first phase of consultation and all these things are actionable. So, uh, so they should already be doing this in their diocese or parish pastoral plan. Uh, so that's part, part one of the action planning which should be already happening now. You don't have to wait until after the, the, the next October assembly. Uh, the second action plan would be at a universal level where uh, some changes to canon law are needed, some changes to uh, church discipline, uh, maybe even uh, theology, magisterial teachings that needs further research. So that's a, more, a longer term uh, action plan. Certainly, uh, we do aspire to at least come up with some of these concrete uh, things from the next uh, assembly. Thank you. Microphone is still open to those who has yes, Father Julio has had queries. Uh, Christina, thanks. Huh? Especially the sharing of personal experience. No? I'm my name is Jojo. I'm taking 101 on synodality here in LSD. Now, what I like to ask is the only spiritual conversation I engaged in was in JCAP, no? where we have silence and we pray and then we share. And then we go second round because the spirit emanates the kind of consensus, eh? in term, even in terms of images. No? When it comes to the third round, we were able to coalesce into a common image. How can that be practiced in terms of the, the group that you facilitate? Did you go into silence? Did you go into that kind of conversation? Maybe I'd like to hear that from you. 
Yes, the structure of the process itself facilitates that kind of convergence. Uh, but the facilitator has to be very good at uh, disciplining people uh, to listen, to make sure they do their prayer and reflection before coming. Uh, and it's very important to slow down the process when you need to, uh, because um, the, the, the faster you go, the harder it is really to, to listen. Um, so um, uh, you need a good facilitator to manage that process. Um, you need to be asking people the right questions. You know, um, what what did you hear? How did you feel? What struck you from from what people said? You know, what what um, does it bring to mind? Or what images arises within you? Uh, what's, uh, what what tensions are, are provoking you? Uh, and by the time you get to that third round. Uh, there should be enough of um, a conversation and reflection uh, to have a more evolved view from the group. So I would say the, the, the rubrics of the, 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 the method itself fosters that kind of, of convergence. Uh, but we mustn't be too naive about it. It's really not easy. Uh, a lot of people don't know how to listen. And then uh, uh, a lot of people told me in their cultures, they don't share feelings. So they don't want to speak about how I feel. They just uh, talk from, from up here. Uh, but, you know, human beings are human beings. They're, they're all stairs. Even if you are used to talking just intellectually, there are other ways, you know, you, you would be sharing from your heart, you know, how, how you feel. Uh, and that it's a matter of finding those ways that are most uh, conducive uh, for the people. Yeah, but, but it's not easy. It, it really uh, takes time. But most of all, it's the, it's the attitude, the, the, the spirituality, the willingness to seek the will of God. Uh, if, you, if they don't come with that aim, then it's a no-go. Uh, I am Jun Min. Sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. Jun Min from Korea, fourth year STB program. Um, I, I just curious about how was the environment when you participated in the meeting? Was it environment kind of welcoming that you feel comfortable? Or I, I'm curious, how was the environment when you go there? Very, very uh, inviting, very, very comfortable. And no point in time as a, a, a lay a woman from Asia, and no point in time that the whole uh, synod process that I feel uh, discriminated again or put down. Uh, I, I'm really very edified. Um, um, cardinals and bishops from whichever continent, that's the amazing thing about this synod. Uh, everyone was so uh, welcoming, uh, very, very uh, hospitable and very keen uh, to engage with each other. So it's, 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 um, it's quite amazing. I mean, the, the whole atmosphere that was uh, engendered uh, by this whole process. Yes, but, but um, um, even then, you know, I should qualify that I speak only for myself because definitely I heard from other people uh, that they felt um, discriminated against, they felt um, uh, ostracized even explicitly, you know, people from certain, certain groups, certain types of communities, they explicitly felt ostracized, so I'm only speaking for myself. So, but, but I think it's good, good to know that, that it was not only ostracism that happened, but there was a lot of hospitality as well. Uh, more questions? Non Jesuit. Uh, Jesuit now. Any non Jesuit? <laughs> Hello, good morning. I'm Lidio, and uh, I'm not Jesuit. <laughs> uh, good morning. I wish to express my gratitude. Thank you so much for giving us a glimpse of, and also your wisdom in sharing these, these, uh, these experiences and the synod on synodality. So, and, I, and I wish to ask, I have so much uh, hope and also inspiration from listening. There's so much to it. 
And I thought to myself, what could be the possible, uh, because we have so much hope and the, the momentum is really going on and there is receptivity around the world, especially for, in the church. What could be, in, our, in, in, in your discernment, especially inside Synodality, what could possibly the stumbling blocks in the momentum going on? And what could be the contingency response of the church? Because this is so, there's so much hope in this one. Thank you. Okay, uh, my first uh, concern would be uh, back at the grassroots. Uh, what people experience uh, is like this ceiling is so uh, fragile uh, that we need to nurture it. Unfortunately, I heard from quite a number of countries that there's no more uh, talk about the synod process. Uh, after the excitement of 2022, when people from the villages and all that, they were so excited, uh, it seemed to have died down a little bit. Uh, so to me, the first stumbling block is the inertia or, you know, the complacency of not addressing, uh, not continuing the momentum. So I really urge uh, the local uh, synod teams, parishes to, to, to keep up the momentum, to, to have um, uh, a whole formation, maybe a formation program to, to reinvigorate basic ecclesial communities because we really emphasize that as, as a way for people at the grassroots to experience synodality, uh, to involve people in consultation for parish life, for parish mission, uh, to go to new frontiers uh, in the mission. Uh, so, so we mustn't let this life uh, die down. And, and what, what we experienced in the first phase of this process was so precious uh, that we, we, it's, it's our responsibility to, to nurture it. Uh, the second stumbling block uh, is in terms of um, perhaps um, uh, um, uh, uh, inability to see different points of view. Um, perhaps for some people, you know, if, if we do uh, change uh, certain uh, church disciplines or certain um, uh, uh, structures, uh, certain rules in our canon law, um, um, it might be so um, different, so unacceptable for them, you know, that, that uh, they might find it hard uh, to, to continue along in this process or, or even in the church. So that, that risk uh, is always there. And that risk has always been there for the whole 2,000 year history of the church. And that's why well, we have to continue to learn um, how to walk together, you know, where we have such differences. And, and to me, it's the way we treat one another that, that makes a difference, that we have to try not to make an enemy out of the other person, but we have to try to find, find ways of, of, of maintaining that, that relationship. That's important. Uh, how... We would really like to more, uh, I don't know, receive more questions, but we could only afford one question. Seize the moment. Who would like to ask? Oh, let's hear from a woman. Oh, a let's woman. Let's hear from a woman. <laughs> 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 Roger, you mean. No, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> okay, thank you. I will really appreciate to be a woman at this time. <laughs> okay, my question, I'm Francois. Uh, my question is about, uh, you talk about uh, Vatican II. You mentioned Vatican II at the beginning of your presentation. And we know before Vatican II, we know how the church was closed, was hostile to the outside of the world. And since Vatican II, we have now a more listening church, a more communal church, we try to gather people, to know the life of people. And my question is about now the upcoming synodality. Uh, what is the, uh, the goal of uh, the, the, this synodality, the synod in synodality? What can be the good news of the synod in synodality in the sense that uh, since Vatican II, we have already a listening church. We are not longer in the terms of uh, being excluded or being not participative. And uh, my question can be related also, if it's not uh, uh, 
uh, a continental gathering, we, what we can gain from this synod, a continental gathering, a opportunity to have a new relationship, a new friends with people. How what can be a new, a good news or a, a new goal for the synod in synodality? If yeah. it's not only having a fun, fun with people gathering and then this thing and this. Okay, um, the synodality is not anything new. It really continues the teaching of Vatican II. What's new is, is that we're actually finally putting it into practice. You know, <laughs> that, that's what's, well, that's what's uh, special about this time that we are living. It's a, it's a 60 year delay in implementing Vatican II. Uh, and, and so, you know, step by step, uh, all, all those uh, changes, uh, those new ways of proceeding that, that I've shared, uh, those are ways of, of putting into practice the teaching of Vatican II about the church as the people of God, about the co responsibility of all the baptized, about the church as as communion. Uh, so so that, that's why it's important to continue this process. Uh, and uh, for the continental meeting, um, um, it's, it's a way to, to help people within the same continent because they share the same context uh, to walk together, walk together uh, more closely, you know, to maybe uh, share um, uh, resources, uh, to share even uh, programs, to share more with, with each other. And that kind of relationship is very important. Yeah, they to be on mission in that continent with, with very uh, specific issues in that continent. Yeah. yeah, I'm not so sure if I understood your, your question correctly, but, but that, that's the, the uniqueness of the continental meeting. So thank you so much, Dr. Christina, for your time. Ah, we will cater one question oh, from a woman. Finally, Doc. <laughs> Thank you for this pr presentation, Christina. It was great. Um, I wondered, on this last question, what's, what's the aim of it, given the Vatican II? I think the number of hands that didn't go up, having studied Vatican II closely, tells us something. There's a lot that we need to keep going back to and drawing strength from. But I also, one thing that struck me as very strong in, in much of what you said and in the writing about this is that it's the church looking outwards. It's not just for ourselves that we're doing this. That perspective that says we have something pretty valuable to offer the world in trying to listen to difference because our world is so divided. And if we can be, if we can do it with all the horrible divisions that are in our church, it's saying to the global world, this, this is possible. We don't have to pick up guns and drop bombs. Yeah. And I think, I think that stress coming through so much of it that Jesus is in the church knocking to get out yeah. and to be able to speak to the rest of the world is sort of central to it in a way. Yeah. Mm. Yes, yes. Thank you for that comment. It's a very important comment with which to close this section. It's really for mission. It's about God's love for humanity and how the world can enlarge the space of its tents, you know, to include everyone, um, uh, to, to counter all this polarization, uh, discrimination that's going on. Uh, it's so precious that we as a church, we have to practice this amongst ourselves uh, so that we can be a uh, witness uh, for the world as well. Thank you. That, that, that's, that's really I mean, the ultimate goal uh, of this uh, um, um, process, God's, God's love and God's desire to, to embrace everyone in the one family. Thank you once again, Doc. Now, since we don't have the luxury of time, so maybe we could use of the technology. So maybe we could gather all together the questions. Maybe Father Rohel could do something about it. And yeah, maybe. So we could email to Doc and then the queries. So again, at, well, that's a good reality joke. So uh, again, at this juncture, may I ask uh, Father Rohel to give us his remarks and the awardings will be assisted by the LST uh, 
President and Vice President. So we thank uh, Dr. Christina Keng for this very valuable input, especially her personal experience uh, sharing of uh, what happened during the, the synod process, the first uh, session, and also the preparatory sessions that uh, took place. Uh, for this, we give her a round of applause. And to show our appreciation, we would like to uh, offer this uh, small token to Dr. Ken. Let us all rise for the closing prayer. <laughs> Almighty Father, we thank you for this gathering this morning. We offer all of our learnings, all of our insights to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, with and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much.